Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in every day listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear a discussion between a salesman and a customer about the items that the customer wants to purchase. First, you have time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm looking for some formal shirts. Please come with me. Formal shirts are displayed at counter number 2. Yes, of course. May I ask what is the occasion, sir? Oh, I have to go for a job interview. That means you need to wear a light-coloured shirt. Checks will look too casual. Yes, show me something in a solid colour. Would you prefer regular fit or slim fit? Well, I usually prefer slim fit, but of late I have put on some weight, so let's go for a regular fit this time. Certainly, sir, though you don't look overweight to me at all. Do you like this shirt? It's not bad, but wait, what is this fabric? It's synthetic, mixed with cotton. Oh, please show me only those shirts that are 100% cotton. I am allergic to synthetic clothing. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Sure, sir. Now, these other shirts are all pure cotton. The blue one would look very good on you. I don't mind blue. It's actually my favourite colour. But do you have a different shade of blue? Something like a sky blue or a powder blue? Yes, I certainly do. Please take a look at this shirt here. I think it's just the colour you want. Yes, this looks very good. Can I get this in size 42? These actually come in four sizes, small, medium, large and extra large. Size 42 would be equal to a large size. In fact, why don't you try a large and an extra large both, and see which one fits you better? Yep, yeah, that sounds good. Can you also tell me how much these cost? The ones I showed you previously was £25, and this one in your hands is £35. Oh, why the difference in price? It's because of the difference in the fabric, sir. While they're both pure cotton, the one in your hands is two-ply cotton. You can make out the difference in quality yourself when you put the two shirts side by side. Yes, the quality of this one definitely looks better. However, £35 seems a little high. I don't even have a job yet. Sir, let me talk to my manager and see if we can offer you some discount. That would be great. If he gives me a good discount, I'll buy both these shirts. I'll be right back. So, I spoke to my manager, and he has said that if you purchase both the shirts right now, we can offer you a flat discount of 25%. So, what will be the price of both these shirts after discount? The total amount of the two shirts is £60. After a 25% discount, the final amount you need to pay is £45. Two shirts for £45 doesn't sound all that bad. I'll take both of them in that case. All right, sir. I'll pack these for you. 
Would you like to check out some trousers to go with these shirts? Uh, well, I don't really need trousers right now. We have an excellent offer going on right now on trousers. If you buy two trousers, you get a third pair completely free of cost. That comes to a discount of about 30%. 33.33% actually. Okay, let's take a look at your trouser section. This way, sir. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear an aquarist talk about how to breed fish in an aquarium. First, you have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Breeding aquarium fish is one of the steps to becoming a skilled aquarist. Once fish are kept healthy enough to spawn, the novice knows that he can attempt to keep more challenging fish. In order to breed a species, the aquarist usually needs to be able to distinguish between the sexes and to be able to recreate natural conditions to stimulate spawning. Always make sure to record your successes and failings in a notebook. Determining the sex of a fish is an important step in knowing whether one has a pair. Most fish can be classified as sexually dimorphic or sexually isomorphic. In sexually dimorphic species, the sexes can be easily distinguished by primary and secondary differences. Males are frequently more colorful larger and have more elaborate finish. The more brilliant examples of sexual dimorphism can be found in Lake Malawi kitchlids, killifish and live bearers. In sexually isomorphic species there are minute if any apparent sexual differences. Often the only way to distinguish between the sexes is the shape of the genital papilla, which is only visible around spawning times. In some isomorphic species, the males are slightly larger and the females are slightly rounder in the belly. Some sexually isomorphic species have no known external sexual differences. Once males and females have been distinguished, a suitable pair or spawning group should be chosen. There are several important traits to seek in choosing the parent fish. First, choose fish that display good markings and color. This should produce attractive young. Second, use only mature, healthy fish for spawning, because unhealthy fish, if they spawn, may produce unhealthy or deformed young. Third, be sure that the pair is compatible. Many species cannot be put together in a breeding tank and expected to get along and produce young. In fact, with many kitchlids, pairs form only after a group has been raised together for months, if not years. In certain species, one partner will bully the other to death, if there is not enough compatibility. Fourth, avoid crossing different strains or color forms, because the young are often unattractive. Fifth and last, make sure that the pair are both of the same species, because hybrids are sterile. With some kitchlids and killifish, females of different species look similar. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The majority of aquarium fish are egg layers with external fertilization. Egg layers can be divided into five groups. Egg scatterers, egg depositors, egg barriers, mouth brooders, and nest builders. Egg scatterers simply scatter their adhesive or non-adhesive eggs to fall to the substrate, into plants, and float to the surface. These species do not look after their brood and even eat their own eggs. These often schooling fish may spawn in groups or in pairs. Often there is a large number of the small eggs laid. They fry hatch quickly. Egg depositors deposit their eggs on a substrate. Egg depositors usually lay less eggs than egg scatterers, although the eggs are larger. Egg depositors fall into two groups, those that care for their eggs and those that do not. Among egg depositors that care for their eggs are kitchlers and some catfish. Egg depositors that care for their young can be divided into two groups, cavity spawners and open spawners. Cavity spawners lay their eggs in a cave, while open spawners lay their eggs on an open surface. These fish form pairs and have advanced brood care, where the eggs are defended and cleaned. The eggs take a few days to hatch, and the fry are often guarded by their parents. Various catfish, cyprins and killifish, make up the majority of egg depositors that do not care for their young. These species lays their eggs against a surface, where the eggs are abandoned. These species do not usually eat their eggs. Egg barriers usually inhabit waters that dry up at some time of the year. The majority of egg barriers are annual killifish, which lay their eggs in mud. The parents mature very quickly and lay their eggs before dying when the water dries up. The eggs remain in a dormant stage until rains stimulate hatching. Mouth brooders are species that carry their eggs or larvae in their mouth. Mouth brooders can be broken up into ovophiles and larvophiles. Ovophile or egg-loving mouth brooders lay their eggs in a pit, which are sucked up into the mouth of the female. The small number of large eggs hatch in the mouth's mouth, and the fry remain there for a period of time. Larvophile or larvae-loving mouth brooders lay their eggs on a substrate and guard them until the eggs hatch. After hatching, the female picks up the fry and keeps them in her mouth. When the fry can fend for themselves, they are released. Nest builders build some sort of nest for their eggs. The nest is usually in the form of bubble nest, formed with plant debris and saliva-coated bowls, or an excavated pit in the substrate. Nest builders practice brood care, that is, they look after their young. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two postgraduate students talking to their professor about their research into academic essay writing. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 26. Come in, Sylvia. Come in, Jim. How are you? A bit tired, actually. I read 75 of the essays about smoking over the weekend. And you, Jim? I'm fine. I've read 20 so far. They're pretty interesting. A really good sample for our research. Yes, I found them stimulating. On the whole, their content is rather good. 
the students have done a fair bit of research. That's true. And they quote from reliable sources. The problems are more with style. Many of the ones I read seemed like oral presentations instead of academic essays. I'd agree with that. For a start, some of the vocabulary was inappropriate. Take this sentence from a conclusion. To get smokers to cut down or give up, there should be more ads on TV about the health problems, etc. Yes. Students forget that get and most phrasal verbs are spoken. Also, they need to steer clear of should and must. When a writer has a hypothesis to prove, he or she doesn't want to put the readers off with such strong language. A writer needs to use verbs like could or might instead. And avoiding adverbs like always and never is a must. After all, you never know when you'll be proven wrong. Absolutely. Over the years, many colleagues have challenged my academic papers. I see you've circled etc., Sylvia, on several essays. Etc. is okay in note-taking, but not in academic writing. Here's something else related to vocabulary. It's part of an argument about why people start smoking. At least, I think the student's written smoking. Maybe it's smocking? Go on. Men who avoid cigarettes may be assigned as nerds. This ideology makes them dare to join in smocking activities to let us know they're real men. That is interesting. I mean, there's an attempt at sophistication with assigned and ideology, but they're both used incorrectly. And nerd and real men are slang. Going back to the word smocking, I read five essays out of 75 in which students wrote about smocking. I must say it made me chuckle. What it does reveal is the danger of spell checkers. They can't alert a writer to words that really do exist. What exactly is smocking? Here's a dictionary definition. Ornamentation on a garment made by gathering together a section of material into tight pleats and sewing across it to make a pattern similar to a honeycomb. It sounds old-fashioned to me. Yes, I had it on a dress when I was a girl. Whatever was it doing in an essay on smoking? Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 27 to 30. So, let's discuss what good academic writers do. How do they avoid the embarrassment of writing about smocking? Simple. They check their work. They write second and third drafts. In redrafting, they also reduce redundancy. Redundancy is a major issue. Listen to this. Secondhand smoke not only affects smokers, but also people around them, even loved ones, like wives and children, and it can lead to illness. What would you have written? Secondhand smoke can lead to illness. Six words instead of 24. Good writers also avoid personal pronouns like I or me. After all, they're trying to construct universal arguments, not just give their opinions. And they put in or take out any capitals, commas, hyphens, or apostrophes where needed. Some of the essays I read certainly needed more paragraphs. They were hard for me to follow. Indeed. An essay is not just about showing what the writer knows. It's about giving the reader an enjoyable experience. So, when do you two think you'll be ready to start the theoretical part of your research? I'm not sure. I'll see you next week about that. I've already started, but I've got so much to read. It seems to me, Sylvia, you've collected more than enough essays to analyze, and now you're in danger of reading too many academic articles. I'd limit the time for your theoretical research to one month, okay? Thanks. That's sound advice. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. You will hear a lecture on road congestion as an example of market failure. Read questions 31 to 40. Sorry I'm late. The traffic was unbelievable. However, my lateness is pertinent to today's topic. Road congestion as an example of market failure. Next week's examples will be carbon emissions and commercial fishing. But what is market failure? Broadly speaking, it's when the free market fails to develop or apportion resources efficiently. A market may fail completely or partially. In the case of complete failure, resources cannot be allocated to satisfy need or want because there are insufficient incentives for profit-seeking firms to enter the market. Take street lighting. Without state intervention, there probably wouldn't be any, as it's unlikely private individuals would pay for it themselves. With no revenue generated, and no profit earned, no firm would enter the street lighting market either. That's why taxes are set aside for public goods. There are many ways in which partial market failure occurs, but I'd like to focus on oversupply, which is when markets produce too many goods or services. It commonly occurs with demerit goods, like alcohol or tobacco, and with negative externalities. What are negative externalities? Well, the inability of consumers or producers to account for the effects of their actions on third parties. Road congestion is a classic case. Oh, let me tell you something I read last night. The speed of traffic in central London has remained fairly constant over the past 100 years. Really? How can that be? Wasn't most traffic horse-drawn in 1916? Indeed, it was. But the fact remains, in central London, giant four-wheel drives and sleek sports cars travel about as fast as wagons pulled by horses. Back to business. There are four main ways of dealing with congestion. One, a city increases the amount of road space. Two, it improves public transport. Three, it reduces the demand for travel, or four, it increases the cost of private travel. In the case of London, the first measure is counterproductive. There are enormous costs associated with construction and a long delay between planning and availability. Once built, more roads only encourage more driving and very soon congestion rears its ugly head again. On the surface, Improving public transport seems a great idea, but even when it's reliable, cheap and convenient, it's viewed as an inferior good. As incomes rise, most of us leave inferior goods behind. I mean, we used to drink beer, now we drink boutique beer. We used to holiday locally at the seaside, now we fly to Thailand. What about reducing the demand for travel? Unfortunately, no one seems to know how to do this. The fourth option, raising the cost of private travel, has also had limited success. In London, we've experienced higher vehicle and fuel taxes, more expensive parking and license fees, no parking routes and a raised driving age. But we've kept on driving. Other big cities have taken a different approach. Some Chinese cities limit drivers to four days a week, based on the final number of their license plate. But the rich just buy two cars. Sydney and Singapore have tolls on bridges and tunnels, yet people pay up or drive longer routes to avoid tolls, creating traffic jams elsewhere. In 2003, London opted for a congestion charge in the central city. Back then, the charge was £5 a day. It's now 11 50 From its inception, there was a discernible decrease in traffic. 
Estimates in 2004 by Transport for London, or TFL, were that traffic flow was reduced by almost 20%, or 50,000 cars per day. Journeys were 15% faster. The number of bus journeys rose by 15%, and cycle usage by 30 TFL stated that road traffic reduced a further 10% between 2011 and 14. However, a recent report has concluded that by 2031, congestion will have worsened by a staggering 60%, even if strict measures are adopted immediately. It seems as though the cycle is similar to building more roads. A sharp initial improvement, a slower improvement over time, followed by stasis and decline. So, to conclude, part of the reason for road congestion is an unquantifiable negative externality, exemplary of partial market failure. The free market is incapable of allocating resources efficiently. No matter what authorities do, people continue to drive. On some level, we all know congestion leads to more noise, pollution, accidents and slower travel times. But cars are cheap and their outlay is fixed. Principally, we drive because we don't consider our actions in relation to anyone else's. And even if we did, I'm not sure most people would care. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you got guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired dance score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.